Okay, at this time the chair calls David Carlson, president and chief operating officer of uh, waste control specialists that we've uh, heard about several times today. Mr. Carlson, thank you for being here today. Uh, if you would please uh, state your, uh, for the record, your name, your title, uh, and your affiliation, and then you may proceed with your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm David Carlson. I'm the president of uh, Waste Control Specialist, the operator of the uh, Texas uh, Compact Facility. Uh, so we operate the Texas Compact Waste Facility, and I want to give you an overview of that. It is a critical facility to the state of Texas. Uh, but first, some of you may not know me, so I'll give you just a tiny bit of background. Um, I've really been in this business for 40 years now. I started as a uh, nuclear submarine officer uh, serving the U.S. Navy and have spent a lot of time internationally and other places uh, uh, conducting this kind of work, uh, including the U.S., Canada, the U.K. Most recently in Japan, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in Fukushima helping to recover from the accident there. So I'm familiar with, uh, with this industry. Uh, I gave you a handout, and I'd like to go to page two of that. And probably the most important thing on that page is the little chart of Texas. And there's a bunch of red dots on that chart. And those are locations in the state of Texas where low-level radioactive waste is generated. The little orange star is where, is where our facility is out in Andrews, Texas. Uh, those places that generate waste, uh, it's a number of different industries. Uh, You know, research facilities such as UT or Texas A&M, uh, hospitals, uh, nuclear power plants, as was mentioned by Eddie previously. Uh, so a number of different industries, oil and gas, uh, military bases. Uh, so this is something that's fairly common. Uh, Low-level radioactive waste is generated by everyday activities, and it's generally not suitable for disposal in a regular landfill. That's why we need specialized landfills for, for low-level radioactive waste. Going to the next page, uh, I know uh, Mr. Seeley covered this pretty well in terms of describing some of the types of waste, but I'd, I'd, I'd just like to reiterate those industries. You know, starting from the top there, uh, these things that are contaminated with radioactive material or have become radioactive, they come from industries such as electric power generation. They come from oil and gas facilities. They come from research. Uh, they come from hospitals. And they come from military facilities throughout our state and also throughout the country. Moving to the next page, I'd just like to go through a little bit of our history and background. Uh, as, as was mentioned previously, we were established uh, as uh, under the Texas Compact by the Low-Level Radioactive Waste Policy Act. That's what granted authority to the states to do this, and Texas chose to, uh, to take this, uh, this effort. Uh, it's codified in, in, in Texas, Vermont, and federal law, so what we do here is codified in law. Uh, the construction of the facility was 100 percent privately financed uh, and opened in uh, 2012, and Texas owns the facility and it's operated by waste control specialists. We're the operator of that Texas-owned facility. Uh, in terms of location, we're in western uh, Andrews County. We're kind of midway or a little bit, a little bit west of halfway between Andrews, Texas, and Eunice, New Mexico. Uh, we're a we're a 14,000 acre site. We use about 10 percent of that for our facilities. So for anybody here who's a rancher, that's about 22 sections. So a fairly you know reasonably sized facility. Uh, we have 9,000 cubic feet of disposal space, of which we've used about 2% of it to date over the past nine years. So it's not filling up particularly quickly. Uh, in terms of our local community, the Andrews community has always supported this facility since its start. In fact, in 2009, Andrews County voters approved a $75 million bond to pay for the uh, construction of the facility. Now, the bond was repaid in 2018, uh, but they did that in order for uh, the facility to go forward. In terms of responsibility for the site, for anything that happens on the site, site closure, long-term storage, those are covered by waste control specialists as the operator and provided for by $150 million in financial assurances, which is more than enough to close that site, but uh, is also validated by the TCEQ. They go through our estimates for that closure and validate that those numbers are the right numbers that should be in place in order to have the money that's necessary to ultimately close the site when, when it's finished. 
Uh, and if WCS is the facility operator isn't allowed to com be competitive, that doesn't ever mean the facility goes away. It's an obligation of the state of Texas to have this facility. So Texas would need to carry on uh, with the facility. Uh, one thing I truly want to emphasize is safety. Uh, safety is something that, uh, that uh, we hear a lot about in all of our industries in Texas, and we're very proud of our impeccable safety record out there. We've gone four times without any lost time, or four years without any lost time accidents. Every time there's even a small incident or a near miss on the site, uh, we take care to sit down, talk about that, and figure out how we can prevent that kind of thing from ever happening again. Uh, radiation safety is also important. Um, our workers receive less radiation on the job than they do from natural radiation in the environment. Our most exposed worker only gets about 10% of the limit for that type of worker. Uh, in our average worker, it's only 1.5%. We don't have radioactive releases from the site, and radiation to off-site persons is zero. In terms of environmental monitoring, we're the most extensively monitored site in Texas and probably in the whole country. We have 343 groundwater monitoring wells, 26 air monitoring stations, 18 external radiation monitoring stations, and we do soil, sedimentation, vegetation sampling, just to make sure that nothing is escaping from that site. Uh, in terms of oversight, uh, we're overseen by TCQ and, and to some extent by other Texas agencies. Uh, we submit reports to those agencies. We've got 294 required submittals that we have in the state of Texas and there's 26 different types of notifications that we provide to the state of Texas as well. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we have two on-site inspectors. They monitor us. They observe all disposals in the compact waste facility. Uh, just to continue to emphasize that environmental safety, on the next page, on page 6, I talk about the robust design of our facility. And I won't go through all of that, but, uh, you know, some of the key things here are first off, we're the newest and by far the most robust facility that's ever been built in the United States. Uh, things that we have going for us is we bury the waste at depth. It's, it's 90 to 120 feet deep when we bury it. Uh, burying below the surface means we can't have erosion, so you think a few thousand years out, you know, rainfall, whatever it might be, we plan for that, and so we can't have erosion on that site that would wash away our cover. Uh, other things there, you look at the groundwater, and this is a good picture of what happens or where we sit in relation to the groundwater. Our first continuous groundwater is 600 feet below the site. That's the Trujillo Formation. And this is non-potable, it's confined, and it's not connected to any aquifer. So it's, it's not drinkable water that anybody is using for anything. Second continuous groundwater is 1,400 feet below the site, the Santa Rosa. Uh, in addition, we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in an arid climate out there. I think everybody knows that's what it's like in West Texas. So our evapotranspiration, that's the water coming up again out of the soil, exceeds the infiltration. So we can't actually have water collecting there to any great extent. Uh, on the next page, just let me talk about geologic stability. I hear about this sometimes, and I really want to, uh, you know, tell you a little bit about it. From a geologic perspective, we don't just look at what's presently there. We have to look into the past and into the future. So deep time is looking into the future. This is a geologic formation that's been stable for 200 million years. 270 million years ago, we actually had water out there. Uh, but we haven't since, and that can't be expected uh, any time in the near future. We're currently 3,400 feet above sea level out there. And our modeling predicts the site will remain dry, both at the surface and the subsurface, even if the climate changes significantly and it becomes wetter out there. Seismically, we have extreme stability, and I, I stuck a couple of fancy words in there, but, but what that means is we don't have any faulting out there. There's no faults in the location, and so, uh, you know, within 100 miles of our location, there's no significant faults that have moved in the last 1.6 million years. So these are all important to us. Uh, to indicate to us that this is a very stable site and stable for any reasonable time frame. Um, on the next page, uh, you know, besides our, our environmental monitoring, our groundwater modeling, and the geologic record, how do we evaluate the site both now and into the future? Well, we do what's called a performance assessment, and this is a very detailed computer model and simulations run on the computer uh, for the site using critical parameters. And I've listed some, like site geology, as I mentioned, uh, but uh, it takes more than just that information. It goes into residential scenarios and says, okay, if at some point in the future uh, 
Texas civilization no longer exists, and so we've lost control of the site. No one remembers what the site was. They built their house on this site. What's the outcome of that situation if that were to happen? Those are the kind of things that get evaluated for in the performance assessment. So scientific standards here are very rigorously applied. Uh, TCQ requires us to look out a million years in the performance evaluation, so that's how far we run our modeling out for the next million years. Uh, and this performance assessment is reviewed and approved by the TCQ's technical uh, experts on it. Uh, what we found in this is that the current disposed inventory has a, has a peak dose, and here we'll get into a little bit of science, of, of 0.5 millirem per year to the most exposed individual. If we have a resident on the site uh, after our civilization ends, and that resident is living on the site. So let me tell you just a little bit about what that 0.5 millirem is. It's, it's uh, you know, for comparison, that's what we have to do because people don't tend to know what a millirem is. Excuse me, Mr. Carlson. If you could, as you're explaining that also, uh, can you explain what the phrase low peak means as well? In Absolutely. conjunction with that. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so, so first with the millirem, so natural background radiation is the radiation we get to our bodies from the natural minerals that are in the ground and from cosmic radiation that comes from space. Uh, that natural background is about 300 millirem a year that we get from those. You get additional beyond that from, uh, from things like medicine. So if you take a CT scan of your chest, a uh, CT scan of your chest would be about 500, 600 millirem in that range. So that's just to be able to gauge what that 0.5 millirem uh, means to you. You know, simple things like a flight in an airplane, if you fly coast to coast, that's about three millirems. So just, just to kind of gauge that kind of thing for you. Um, in terms of the peak dose, what that means is in the most extreme situation, at the most extreme point in time, in this case it happens to be 170,000 years out that this would occur, that person who's living on the site has decided that that's where his garden should be, that's where his house should be, because we've lost control and it's a different civilization at that point in time. That would be the exposure to that person that 0.5 millirem. Uh, moving to the, uh, to the next and final slide, uh, let me talk a little bit about the situation that we're in today for the low-level radioactive waste market. So when the site was originally envisioned, and this is way back into the 90s and so, legislators assumed that uh, the compact waste facility would have a monopoly on radioactive waste and therefore that it should be, or should be regulated more or less like a uh, regulated utility with the price setting and those kind of things that we would expect for a regulated utility. Uh, however, the management of radioactive waste disposal has changed significantly since that original legislation was passed. We have improved, improved our waste minimization strategies uh, throughout all industries and so we see less waste. Uh, we've increased the options for radioactive waste disposal at other facilities, including some of this waste goes to hazardous waste disposal sites, some of it goes to municipal landfills today. Uh, I'd also like to mention that most of the revenue that comes to the Texas Compact Waste Facility, about 90% of the revenue, comes from generators outside of the Texas Compact. What that means is that without that outside revenue, the facility wouldn't be able to operate. There simply isn't enough revenue from inside the state of Texas to provide uh, money to make the site operate. Uh, so really for the Texas Compact Waste Facility to remain economically viable, we need some updates to the economic and financial aspects of Texas legislation. And in closing, I'd say the Texas Compact Waste Facility remains a very vital resource for Texas low-level radioactive waste generators. And I'd welcome any questions you might have. Members, are there any questions for Mr. Carlson? Representative Goodwin. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. You said something about near misses and um, not ever having an accident, but I'm curious what an example of a near miss might be. Absolutely. So if uh, someone is, for example, backing a truck and uh, didn't turn on the, or, or didn't sound the horn to uh, indicate that they were backing up, you know, that would be a hazardous situation. You expect every time somebody backs up a truck that they're going to beep, beep, beep on the horn and make sure that everybody is aware of that. So it can be those types of things, as simple as that, that would be a near miss that we would have to look out for uh, and make sure it doesn't happen. Certainly we're an industrial site, and so our major hazards on the site are big pieces of equipment and heavy things that might be, you know, at some height in the air, and we have to be extremely careful about all those kinds of things. Um, so 
you you mention medical waste a lot and and not having the high level so you don't have things like plutonium or at, at your site right so let me I'll, I'll define high level waste for a second high level waste is two things really high level waste is used nuclear fuel that's come out of a reactor of some kind and it's certain parts of the reprocessing waste uh, in instances where used nuclear fuel has been reprocessed. We don't take any kind of used nuclear fuel or reprocessed, or those types of reprocessing wastes that are high-level waste. And uh, you talked a little bit about not being um, financially feasible unless you increase how much waste you're taking, I guess. Is that correct? Uh, there's other bits to it. So there's actually more in legislation that keeps us from being uh, economically viable for the long term. So if I look at it, it's, it's really, uh, you know, three things that keep us from being economically viable today for the long term. Uh, you know, one would be uh, certainly the limitations that are put annually and overall on the import of radioactive waste that kind of paces the, the, the rate that it can come in. But we also run out of space for out of compact waste in, in not too many years, uh, which of course would force us to uh, not be able to operate the site at that point. Um, you know, the others are, are uh, the taxes that are applied. Uh, we pay 31.25% of our revenue as surcharges or taxes, uh, which are, uh, certainly out of line with any other place in the country. Uh, our main competition is Utah, and they pay 5 to 10% of their, of their taxes uh, uh, in cert, or of their, of their revenue as surcharges. So a very different situation, but we compete with them. That's what we have to do. Uh, you know, so that's another, another piece of it as well. Uh, the last thing that's, a, that's really a bit of a problem for us is that our rates are set by rulemaking. Again, I mentioned that we were treated as a, uh, as a public utility, more or less, when the compact uh, was put into place. And so, you know, with that monopoly situation, you'd expect that, uh, you know, the, the state would be required to come in and set the rates. However, what we really are is we're in a competitive situation, but we still have to go through that rulemaking to set the prices. And so what that does is for me to respond to the marketplace and change a price, uh, it can take uh, up to a year to go through the rulemaking process. And that's published out. So my competitor, of course, has that information immediately or as I'm going through the rulemaking process, so they can certainly respond to it uh, very quickly. My last question. So is there a concern from people about waste coming in and how it's transported and any potential for accidents along the way? I, I, I'm sure there are people that are concerned about that, but I would like to reassure you, and I can go through, uh, through reasons why, that it's probably one of the safest types of transportation we have in the state of Texas and, uh, and throughout the country. Uh, in the state of Texas, radioactive waste transportation is uh, regulated by the Department of State Health Services. And I know they're not here today, or I don't think they're here today. Uh, but they have a number of things in place uh, to ensure the safety of transportation. Uh, transporters of radioactive waste have to be registered with the uh, Department of State Health Services. They have to put emergency plans into place and provide those to DSHS. They have to have proof of financial responsibility. They have to have a minimum of $5 million of insurance. Uh, but more than that, it's, it's the things that come into effect uh, as they're transporting the waste. Uh, there's things like, for most waste shipments, uh, there's satellite tracking of the waste shipment. Uh, they're required to check in for the most part every four hours uh, while they're on their trip or there will be a call from their head office trying to locate where they are. Uh, for more radioactive ship waste shipments, uh, Department of State Health Services actually sets the route for that shipment. So they have a, a route that's provided and you have to stay on that route. And if you deviate from that route, uh, you have to tell Department of State Health Services. Uh, you know, first responders, people talk about first responders and, and what about our first responders? Well, our first responders are actually trained in hazardous materials and they have a book that they carry with them, the emergency response guidelines. And what they can do, if there was to be some kind of an incident with a, with a radioactive waste shipment, they would see the placard on the side of the truck and the placard on the side of the truck would go right into their emergency response guidebook and the emergency response guidebook tells them exactly what to do in that instance. Now, there's additional information in the cab of the truck, so if they get to the cab of the truck, they would pull out the additional information, and they can call an 800 number that's there, and calling that 800 number, 
puts them in contact with nationwide experts in how to deal with the situation. Uh, what also happens is all of our comp all the transporter companies, the railroads and so on, uh, have services that are on contract with them that would be responders to any kind of incident that may happen. Uh, but let me, let me roll it back for a second and, and talk about waste form of radioactive waste. The waste form of radioactive waste is inert. It's generally, yes, it gives off radiation, but it's inert. It's not explosive. It's not poisonous. It's not gas. So it's really not dispersible. And so that's, you know, many people are concerned about dispersible things. You think about a chlorine, you know, a rail car goes off the rails and it's got chlorine gas in it. Yeah, people would worry. Of course, that's going to disperse into the local area and you have to clear out a, ride, a, a wide area to deal with that. In the case of radioactive waste, that's not the same situation. I, I want to read one thing from the Emergency Response Guidebook just because I, I, I find it, uh, you know, really quite interesting if I can find it in here. Um, if I go to the emergency response guidebook for uh, for emergency response to uh, to dealing with uh, radioactive waste uh, incidents, it says radiation presents minimal risk to transport workers, emergency response personnel, and the public during transportation accidents. Packaging durability increases as potential hazard of radioactive content increases. So that's coming right out of the first responders handbook, and that's the best information that we provide to those first responders so that they can know how to deal with an incident if an incident were to occur. Thank you for that. I, I was actually thinking about the emergency response that you might have. So you answered two two question two two answers that without my having to ask two questions. If if you'll humor me with one more thing. You showed a diagram of uh, things being stored underground. So does that mean everything that you store is stored underground? So we're a low-level radioactive waste disposal facility. So everything that we take in and dispose of goes into that underground uh, uh, disposal cell. So we, you know, while we store a few things on site for some period of time, typically less than a year, uh, everything goes to disposal in those disposal facilities. Mr. Chairman. Explain the one second, Representative Kemple. Oh, I'm sorry. Kemple, no, Vicky, were you done? I'm okay. sorry, Representative Kemple. No, explain. I've I've had the opportunity to tour the facility, and it, man, it's clean as a whistle. It's, and just the disposal cells. Explain those. Sure. So we have several disposal cells on the site today. I've been talking about the compact waste facility, but there's actually four disposal cells on the site. Uh, one is a federal waste facility that's entirely the responsibility after closure of the federal government. Uh, we have the compact waste facility I've mentioned. We have a byproduct waste facility that's only been used for one particular waste stream and will also be the responsibility of the federal government ultimately. And then we have a RECRA facility that takes extremely low level waste, low levels of radioactive waste as well as uh, hazardous materials that would go into a normal uh, RECRA landfill. And they'll still the, encase everything in concrete. So the design of those landfills are, you know, particularly in the compact waste facility, if we bring something in, it would come in typically in some kind of a metal container. We take that metal container and we stick that inside of a concrete container. Then the concrete container goes down in the cell. In the lining of the cell, we have uh, what would be called a geotechnical fabric. It really means a, a, a big, thick plastic liner. We have two layers of that. So, uh, you know, one is the collection and one is the layer to check to make sure that you don't have any kind of leakage through there. So we check for leakage of, of the liner, of course. But really, if you think about the long term, all of those things aren't nearly as important as the red bed clay that we're in. So the red bed clay that we have there, I know it's not continuous all the way through, through West Texas. There's a lot of areas where it isn't. But in our site, we are lucky enough to have an outcrop of red bed clay that's continuous for 600 feet. So we have done uh, an incredible amount of characterization of that site. I think over time we've had as many 600 wells in at that site, just looking at the subsurface and trying to understand the subsurface fully. That red bed clay, you think about it, if there was a, if there was a head of water, if there's water piled up on top of that red bed clay, the fastest that water would move is about four feet per thousand years. That stuff is, is you know, less permeable than concrete. Things just aren't going to go through it. We have a concrete liner in the cell as well, but, you know, again, uh, it's the red bed clay that uh, really makes it different. Is that one reason why that the site that, I mean, one reason why that site was located was because of the red bed clay? Absolutely. The Andrews Industrial Foundation, which started, I don't know, about three decades ago now, they understood that situation out there, and they actually tried to bring industry out there. 
uh, because of that unique situation that they had. Or at least that's what I'm told. I went around 30 years ago in that area. Sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, surcharges and how that affects your viability relative to competitors in other parts of the country. Tell, tell us a little bit more, if you would, please, about the surcharges. I think what you, you said, uh, 30... 31.25 percent. Sure. Let me, yeah. let me and, break and it down. Also, let us know where those like where are those paid? OK. Uh, you know, so first off, if 5 percent of our re revenue goes to the host community. That's Andrews County. And they use that for projects that are to benefit all the residents of that uh, of that county. Uh, 1.25 percent of revenue goes to the activities of the Compact Commission. So we pay for the Compact Commission that uh, uh, that Ms. Raines was here speaking to you about. 20% uh, goes to the Environmental Radiation Perpetual Care Fund. What's that, used, what's that is used for is to clean up sites where the owners have abandoned the site or declared bankruptcy. That tends to be uranium miners in the state uh, that have abandoned the sites or declared bankruptcy. 5% uh, goes to general revenue to be used for any purpose of the state. So that's, you know, that's the total of 31.25%. But in addition to that, we do pay for the uh, activities, the supporting activities of the TCEQ. So we pay, you know, for what our regulator provides to us. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Department of State Health Services charges transporters. Sorry, let me go back. Would it be more accurate? I mean, you're not paying for that. That surcharge is paid to the state, and then that revenue is then used to... Uh, cover the expenses or operations of TCEQ that are on site. Is that is that so? The thirty-one point two five percent does not pay for TCEQ. Mm -hmm. So that's they send us a billing every year for the costs that are relevant to our site. That's over and above the surcharge. That's over and above the surcharges. That's correct. Uh, and then the Department of State Health Services charges ten dollars per cubic foot of waste that goes into the uh, waste disposal facility. Ten cubic foot. You know, so ten dollars per cubic foot, uh, and what that does is that funds their emergency response activities. So, you know, those are the fees that we pay to the state. And in addition to normal taxes, I mean, we're in Andrews County, and so we got to pay taxes out there and so on. And then uh, you mentioned, uh, I think, when you were repre uh, answering Representative Goodwin's question about that thirty-one point two five percent, and then you used Utah as a as another example of a surcharge that's paid at the facility there that is about ten percent. Is that Who's more in line with kind of the mainstream in, in the country? Right. So there's only two facilities that serve the entire country for Class A waste. It's us and the facility in Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, the facility in Utah, depending on what the waste is, charges uh, about 5 to 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, that also actually goes to pay their regulators. They're a little bit different in that way. So we're actually uh, paying about three times what's paid in in Texas, we pay about three times what's paid in Utah. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, because customers only look at the end price with all the taxes applied, uh, that means we have to continue to push our price down less than the other folks just to stay competitive. Additionally, if you were to do a comparison of the two sites, again, we're by far the most robust facility in the country. You know, other facilities in the country, what do they do? Well, they're so close to the groundwater that they can't dig down into the ground to put their waste into the ground. So they end up piling the waste on the surface and then, you know, throwing dirt on it, you know, when they're done. Actually, they do more than that. It's a real cap. But, uh, you know, we're the most expensive facility in terms of cost because we're the most robust. But I'm extremely proud of the fact that we are the most robust facility. Members, any other questions? Representative Dean. So... How often do y'all's contract or fees, I mean, is that negotiated periodically or, or what? So we sign contracts with uh, our, our various customers, and so we would tend to sign two or three or four-year contracts. If you sign too long of a contract, you don't know what the future looks like, and so you may not you know, want to go that far out. Uh, all of those contracts that we do sign, however, uh, go through TCEQ. So TCEQ has a... Uh, a right to uh, review and approve those contracts ultimately. I guess my question is, the, all all the fees that y'all are paying, are those passed through back over to the customer? Well, certainly they're passed the through. 31.25 or whatever, that's crazy. But, I mean, you pass that through or? Well, certainly it's passed through in a sense, uh, but... You know, if you take the price plus tax, and ours is $100, and you take the price plus tax, and the other guy's is $100, 
uh, well, yeah. you know, 31.25 of that is, is, is going for the tax and the rest goes to cover the cost of the site. And in their case, it'd be very different. So where, where, are the, where is this uh, being reviewed, all of these fees and in, in trying to get a financial structure uh, to remain economically viable? Where is this being looked at or what committee or where, where is this being looked at? So there was a joint committee about three years ago that uh, took a good look at both facilities. I, I know, uh, Chairman, you were on that uh, that joint committee, and they put out a report from that. And I think uh, there was an understanding that uh, really these fees did need to get looked at. The fees are in statute, uh, so the only way that those fees can be changed yeah, is legislatively. They're not uh, put in place by rulemaking. What, what committee speaker, uh, speaker, Chairman, looks at that? I mean... Uh, that be well, an approach thing, or where, where does that go? Uh, historically, um, because the jurisdiction of the Committee on Environmental Regulation specifically addresses the low-level radioactive waste compact commission, uh, that's typically uh, been a matter for the Environmental Reg Committee to okay. discuss. Okay. Good. Sounds like it needs to be looked at very closely again. Thank you. Representative Morales Shaw. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Uh, you talked about rate and space as two of the issues. At the rate it's working now, what is the capacity of the space that you are currently at? Well, in a decade, we've used about 2% of the capacity, uh, so that would be about 500 years, I suppose, at that rate. Okay, so you don't force in, there's no plans in the foreseeable future to have to have a second site? or another location. So we're licensed for 9 million cubic feet today. Mm -hmm. And so that 9 million cubic feet at current rates, uh, again, would be filled up in about 500 years. So we're not thinking quite that far forward. Okay. And the other question I had is how, when at your site, where is the beginning of habitability as far as range from, from where your site is? So our from closest neighbor is how far at least about five miles away. Uh, Eunice, New Mexico is actually the closest uh, community to us. So it's the habitability, habitability starts at about five miles where it's safe? Oh, uh, you, we have people on site every day, and so they're getting, you know, insignificant amounts of dose typically. So uh, you could build right, I mean, if, if we didn't own the land, you could build right up to our fence line, you'd be fine. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Representative Goodwin. So do you have any uh, plans for taking in high-level waste? Do you have any applications um, to NRC? Right. So we've submitted an application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for interim storage of spent nuclear fuel or used nuclear fuel. However, you know, one thing I want to make absolutely clear in that we have always said is that without the consent of the state of Texas, we will not build or operate that facility. So are you looking for the consent of the state of Texas? I think the governor has been clear on his position on that. Thanks. Members, any other questions? Uh, Mr. Carlson, uh, Representative Kempel mentioned that he's been to the, the site, of course, with it being in my district, full disclosure, I've been there several times. Uh, and it's always uh, a, a great learning experience. If other members of the committee, uh, I think, Representative Morales Shaw had some good questions about, you know, come what, what that looks like. If any of the members would like to visit the facility to see for themselves, is that something that could be accommodated? Absolutely. We, we stopped tours for a period of time during uh, uh, last summer, uh, but for people that have a legitimate reason to come to the site like this committee would, we absolutely uh, would have those, those visitors come on site and we practice very careful COVID-19 precautions. And I'm Representative Kempel. Thank you. And it, just to piggyback on that, you, you know, when we went out there and I go, that's it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's simple. It really, it really kind of is. I go, that's it. Wow, cool. Right. Let's go eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Members of the room. I'd like to reiterate that there's a lot of science behind it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Members, are there any other questions for Mr. Carlson? If not, Mr. Carlson, uh, thank you for your time and your testimony. Thank you very much. And uh, members, uh, Mr. Carlson is also our last uh, invited witness on the agenda. Uh